Hi, and welcome. My name is Ira Flato, and I'm host of Public Radio Science Friday. I've been talking with scientists on my radio program and podcasts for, what, over 30 years now. I've been a science reporter for longer than that and have uh, followed the intriguing research that the Technion produces year after year. I am delighted to host this online webinar, Reimagining the Future. My interest in the Technion goes way back to my first visit there in 1974 and a tour of the research facilities. Much has changed since then. Science has moved forward. There are fields now that, that did not even exist back then, some of which I hope we'll touch on today when we talk about the future. Let me tell you first a little bit about the place. From the day it opened its doors to students in 1924, the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, has played a unique role in the lives of people in Israel and across the globe, from building roads to building an air force, from shaping a successful startup nation to shaping a science literate society. The university has been with Israel every step of the way. It has also launched generations of extraordinary engineers and distinguished scientists whose ingenuity has gifted the world with a stunning array of innovations and advances in disciplines, ranging from aerospace engineer to medicine, sustainability to security, chemistry to material science and beyond. Well, what comes next? How will the Technion further transform our world in the next 100 years? The Technion's achievements and breakthroughs highlight the university's collaborative culture that so often lead to incredible discoveries and world-shaping science. So today, we're gonna to take a look at what we might expect to come out of the Technion in the next century. And I have a whole panel of guests for you. Our guests today are just a small sampling of the creative minds from the Technion, but their work represents the wide-reaching areas that will certainly impact how we live and work in the next century. So let me introduce them to you. First of all, Professor Emeritus Peretz Lavi. He's an early pioneer of sleep research and was the 15th president of the Technion. He published more than 400 scientific articles and eight books in the field of sleep research and sleep disorders. His best selling book, The Enchanted World of Sleep, has been translated into 15 languages. Peretz was the founder or co founder of five companies that develop and produce medical devices for sleep medicine and cardiology and provide diagnostic services. Currently, he is chairman of Israel's National Council of Research and Development. During his presidency, he transformed the Technion into a global player and was instrumental in creating the Joan and Erwin Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute in New York City and Guadang Techno Technion Israel Institute of Technology in China. Welcome to the program. Next up on our list is Professor Hagid Atia. Uh, she teaches in the Technion's Henry and Marie, Marilyn Taub Faculty of Computer Science. She joins the Technion in 1990 after a postdoc at MIT. She was executive vice president for academic affairs at the Technion from 2015 to 2019 in charge of developing the academic faculty of the Technion through recruitment, promotion, and retainment. <clears throat> Professor Atia studies uh, methods to build efficient and correct language scale distributed systems that tolerate failures. And maybe we'll get a little bit more into those details later. Welcome to you. Next up, Associate Professor Ido Roll. He teaches in the Faculty of Education in Science and Technology and the Faculty of Data and Decision Science at the Technion. He's also a member of both the Teaching Committee for the Program for Ethics and Artificial Intelligence and the Behavioral Research Ethics Board. His research bridges between learning analytics and learning design to better understand, assess, and support the growth of learners into competent critical thinker scientists and creative problem solvers. Together with Peretz, Hagit, and Ido, we'll reflect on what the Technion has accomplished during its remarkable first century and discuss what we might expect in the next. 
What kind of science might come out of the multidisciplinary culture of the Technion? Where are some of today's cutting edge technologies heading? How does the Technion differ from other similar institutions? These are some of the big essential questions I'm eager for us to dive into. So let's get into that. But before I do, I wanna mention that I'll be taking questions from viewers, from you folks at the end of our conversation. So please use the Q&A function on the webinar screen to submit your questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. So, so let's begin. I wanna start with Parrots. Parrots, let me begin with you. Give us some background on who founded the Technion and the reasons for opening a technological university in the Ottoman Empire. Well, I, uh, the idea to have uh, a Jewish university was raised uh, around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the Zionistic Congress in 1901 appointed a committee to look into this question. The chairman of the committee was uh, Chaim Weizmann, a scientist by himself. At that time, he was an assistant professor in Geneva. And uh, they came a uh, few years later and recommended to open a technological uh, university. Uh, but the, uh, the move was taken by a group from Berlin, independently of the Zionistic uh, movement, a secular Jewish group from Berlin uh, named uh, Ezra, Help. And they decided to open uh, an engineering school in uh, Palestine at that time under the Ottoman Empire in order to educate engineers to build Palestine. Now, the question was how to do it. And in fact, uh, uh, they raised money from two sources. One came from Moscow, the first gift. The Vysotsky family, the uh, tea merchants, uh, the tycoons of the time uh, gave them uh, 100,000 rubles. And then uh, accidentally, there was a visitor in Berlin by the name of Jacob Schiff, an American banker from New York. And uh, he met the group, was uh, very impressed. And he decided to give a matching gift of $100,000. Interestingly enough, he had three conditions. The first condition was the name of the school shouldn't be the Vysotsky School of Engineering. This was the first idea uh, uh, for naming the school because of the gift. Second, this school should have a board of governors uh, comprising of uh, um, representatives of Jewish communities from around the world. And the third one, which to me seems the most amazing requirement at that time, we're talking about 1908, this school should accept students regardless of ethnic origin, religion, and gender. Remind, I should remind everybody that around that time, uh, very few universities accepted uh, women as students. So the money came and they built uh, on the slope of the Carmel Mountain, uh, a building which uh, um, is an amazing uh, uh, architectural uh, uh, structure that was uh, designed by uh, a German uh, architect by the name of Alexander Berwald, who later became the first dean of architecture in the Technion. And uh, the cornerstone was laid uh, in 1912. Uh, this building, as you see now on the slide, uh, was ready in 1914. But then, unfortunately, the First World War started and the Turks uh, changed the building into a military hospital. So we waited for uh, 10 years until 1924. Uh, then at that time, the first class of 17 students started. Um, this is the story of the Technion. Uh, interestingly enough, in 1923, uh, the man at the center, uh, uh, I'm sure everybody recognized him, Albert Einstein, visited the Technion. By the way, at that time they offered him a job, but he decided to go back to Berlin and became the first uh, 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 president of the societies that support the Technion around the world. Uh, uh, he was very instrumental in supporting the Technion. 
And on the right, you can see the tree that he planted. They planted, he and his wife planted two trees. And this tree stand up to uh, these days uh, uh, in the um, uh, old building, which is now a science museum. The Technion was uh, a teaching uh, institute until 1954. In 1954, it was transformed slowly into a research university when it moved to uh, a new campus. The campus, uh, the first building was too small and it moves to the, uh, what we call a Neve Shanan, a, a suburb of Haifa. Uh, the decision to move the Technion from its original place to uh, the, the new site was made by David Ben-Gurion. You can see him, the first prime minister, the legendary prime minister of Israel. You can see him uh, uh, observing the site uh, in the picture on the right. Uh, he was the one who made the decision and he encouraged the Technion because he saw the Technion as one of the most important institutes for the future of the newly established country, uh, Israel. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the man who was uh, um, in fact responsible for transforming a teaching university to a research university was uh, Professor Sidney Goldstein. He was recruited from University of Manchester in England and he became the Dean of the Aerospace Engineering Faculty, the first faculty to open on the Carmel site. And he was the one who established the graduate school in the Technion. And uh, from there, uh, uh, everything is, uh, as we say, is a history. This is the Technion right now. Uh, we are going to celebrate next year, uh, the centennial uh, 100 years from the establishment of, of the opening of the first class. And uh, this is, in a nutshell, the history of the Technion. Uh, Parrots, very nice, very nice summary. I want, I want to know, though, that, that during your presidency, the Technion became a global university, right, with branches in China and New York. Tell us about that and the role the universities and the Technion specifically have a national economic development? Well, uh, I, I, uh, if you try to imagine Israel without the Technion, Israel would be a completely different country. In your opening remarks, you said that uh, Technion is responsible for from Air Force uh, uh, bases all the way to uh, uh, unbelievable uh, uh, projects like Iron Dome, uh, these are Technion graduates. The Technion, in fact, for many years was the only engineering school in Israel. Everything that has to do with the development of industry, uh, uh, infrastructure in Israel uh, was made possible by uh, Technion uh, uh, alumni. So uh, uh, the Ben-Gurion prediction regarding the future of the Technion uh, uh, was uh, uh, in, in fact reading the future uh, um, so the Technion played a major, major role in the uh, uh, beginning uh, uh, of, uh, of Israel in the establishment of the infrastructure of a newly uh, uh, established country. Later on, the Technion played a major role in what we call now startup nation. In fact, Technion uh, uh, alumni, uh, Technion graduates uh, uh, are responsible for attracting to Israel most of the multinational companies that open an R&D center, research and development centers in Israel, some, many of them in Haifa, because they rely on the talent and uh, uh, um, the, uh, uh, I would say, the uh, enthusiasm of uh, Technion graduates. I, I, when I was a president, I ran a study to find out how many startup companies uh, uh, are related to Technion graduates. The number are in thousands. It's simply unbelievable. So uh, the Technion played a huge, uh, a decisive role in uh, building Israel as a startup nation. And I truly believe that uh, um, this led to the success of globalization. You know, uh, the opportunity in New York came when Mayor Bloomberg asked 55 universities to provide a proposal to build a research center, a university 
in New York in order to help the economy of New York. And he approached the Technion to participate in uh, this uh, uh, competition. Uh, at the beginning, I thought that somebody was pulling my leg. I wasn't sure that uh, the, the letter came from Mayor Bloomberg, but uh, I called up the city and they say, yes, we would like the Technion to take part in this competition. And um, to make a long story short, we teamed up with Cornell. We built a program that was tailor-made to the economy of New York. And lo and behold, we uh, won the competition. When I asked Mayor Bloomberg in four eyes, uh, just before we announced that Technion Cornell won the competition, why Technion, for God's sake? Why Technion? You have all the best universities in the world. You have some of the best technological institutes in the world. He told me, you took Jaffa oranges and you changed them into semiconductors. I'd like you to do the same for New York. I told him, okay, if you transfer Jaffa oranges to apples, we will do it. So the idea was, uh, Tom Friedman said that the world is flat. Uh, academic education has become a global enterprise. And this is why we decided to go global. We had the opportunity in New York, we had the opportunity in China, and uh, in China they are teaching in English, Technion uh, uh, courses, and most of these students, by the way, continue to, uh, to graduate studies in the best universities in the world. And in New York, it became a model for education for the 21st century. And uh, uh, we are uh, very happy about the success of both enterprises. Very interesting history, especially I love the Jaffa oranges turning into computer chips. Um, Hagid, Hagid uh, what is your, in your opinion, uh, Hagid, is, is the secret sauce, do you think, of the Technion's academic success? Can you give us some examples there? So one thing to note is that uh, this history that uh, Peretz just uh, uh, reminded us of is really ingrained into the Technion's DNA. And for me, actually having studied elsewhere, uh, one thing that you realize once you are at the Technion is that uh, uh, the faculty and the whole institution has a, a commitment to uh, society, to especially the land of Israel, but to community at large. And there's a responsibility that comes out of it as uh, in what we say is the shlichut or Zionism, the commitment to impact the way this country is. And uh, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing, let me, um, the other thing is this, uh, uh, what I would call an engineering approach. And again, you could hear it from the history. You could see where it comes from. Uh, so an engineering approach means that you see uh, practical worlds in, uh, pr problems in the world, and you look for ways to solve them in a very uh, down to earth, yet uh, extremely innovative. And I have on the slide, uh, the uh, Lempel Ziv, Yaakov, uh, Jacob Ziv and Avram Lempel actually uh, from the Faculty of uh, electrical, electrical and Computer Engineering and from Computer Science uh, uh, faculty. Unfortunately, both of them uh, um, just passed uh, this year. And uh, they invented what's called the lempel ziv algorithm. And the lempel ziv algorithm is basically a, a mathematical object, an algorithm that takes a string, basically a string of characters, and uh, basically compresses it very, very efficiently. So you could uh, transfer the information uh, in a much more efficient, much faster than actually transferring the whole, um, the whole uh, string. And this means that whatever we do, actually, since the, this algorithm is from, uh, I think, 77, and uh, whatever you do since then on the internet is basically using this algorithm to transfer the information. So something that is uh, an interesting uh, mathematical object, an algorithm, there's like a really nice mathematics there, is actually turned, is employed in order to do something very practical, very important, and very um, uh, utilitarian. Uh, the other, uh, the, uh, the third uh, concept or, or element, I think, that makes the technion different is the curiosity-driven, the bold, uh, uh, ambition, the uh, being uh, uh, 
being uh, brave enough to challenge uh, challenge uh, uh, the dogmas and the paradigms uh, that are out, out there. So I have on this slide that we have uh, our Nobel laureates, uh, the uh, um, Hershko and uh, Chachanover, um, uh, Dan Schechtman, and Arya Warshall that we uh, <laughs> adopt as well. And all of them, uh, you could uh, see that they have been uh, looking at uh, at the world and observing, doing scientific experiments, and basically being unafraid to uh, to call out what they are seeing, and 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 unafraid to go to places that other people didn't dare to, and uh, to do uh, an, a novel uh, uh, concepts. So I think these three concepts: the commitment to uh, Israel and the world. Uh, the engineering, uh, the practical uh, uh, engineering approach, and the boldness uh, is uh, probably. Uh, Ira, um, during the inaugural speech in 1924, when the first class started, Menachem Mosishkin, now is a street in every city in Israel, but he was one of the leaders, he was a, a mining engineer, started his speech by saying, This school will have both practical science and fundamental science. And this is something that has become part of the DNA of the Technion, as Chagit just mentioned. And this is part of, uh, um, I would say, the mission of our university, uh, providing service to society, to the country, as part of the opening uh, speech uh, uh, for the first class of 17 students. Well, you have given me a great segue into my next question as a good lead in parrots, because I want to ask Ido that given the, the pace in which science and technology advance, how can the Technion prepare future scientists, engineers, doctors, architects, teachers, whomever? How do, how do you prepare them? Uh, thank you, Ira, for this question. Um, the first thing that we do is to try to define what it is that we want to prepare. How can we take people and help them transform into these competent leaders and scientists, engineers, et cetera. And we actually do this process very consciously uh, involving a lot of deans and faculty members and of course uh, at the management. And, and I'll give you a glimpse of this. I think if we look at uh, education and uh, technological education, it actually uh, started here and what we see here is a, a small snapshot from uh, Charlie Chaplin's uh, Modern Time, the seminal movie. And what we see is uh, the, the role of the people, the workers there were like that, right? To, to use a wrench and to, and to keep uh, uh, working with the bolt there. Um, so the purpose of education was to teach you how to use a tool, to teach you to be productive. But productive meant uh, follow orders and keep doing the same thing again and again. And then the goal of education changed and now when we think of education, we think about the many wrenches that people need to learn to work with. And we say, well, they learn five wrenches and tomorrow there'll be a new one, right? We, we studied one computer, now there's a new computer, then there is a phone or a tablet. I think what we understand now is that this was probably true 50 years ago. And the purpose now is not to learn to use new tool, but rather to develop new tools. And that is a very different challenge. So my challenge here is not just to teach, to adapt to what's coming, but actually to generate the knowledge, not to consume it. Now, this is very hard because what we ask our students to learn to do is to solve problems to questions that we do not know about. The examples are obvious, right? Like a year ago, very few people predicted chat GPT, right? A couple of years ago, very few people uh, predicted the pandemic. A decade ago, certainly very few people uh, predicted their food shortage or the uh, climate crisis. So we have problems that we do not know yet. Further, we don't know which questions to ask. So this is the goal for us at the Technion. How do we prepare people to solve problems where we do not even know which questions to ask? And I think we try to treat this as indeed an engineering challenge. How do we do this? How do we design our curriculum and learning environment? And the answer is to let people experience with this. So I'll quickly give three examples. In one of our major data science courses, rather than teaching methods and having students apply them, 
which is not very different from Charlie Chaplin teaching methods and having uh, the workers apply them. We actually start by asking questions. So we'll take students, we'll give them several COVID tests, uh, the data from COVID tests, and we'll ask them, well, which test is more reliable? And they start developing and, and, and reaching very profound understanding. Uh, would we rather have many false alarms and, and hurt uh, the economy and people by giving false alarms? Or would we rather actually miss some uh, uh, true positives and, or false positives, right? Like where we actually get people and we miss them. And then they try to develop data-driven methods to predict accuracy of uh, uh, COVID tests. Now, the method that they create are not perfect, but they're very creative. And it's okay, we work with this later when we teach them. But they, this is an example of how we begin from the problem rather than beginning from the solution. Let us take this closer to the field. We have a thriving and fantastic uh, social hub, which is in charge of relationship with the community in which we operate. So for example, computer science students solve real world problem. For example, they created a beautiful management framework that they give for free to nonprofits. So nonprofits now have products that they could not afford otherwise. Computer science students solve real world problem. Going further into the real world, we work closely with the industry on internship, on uh, uh, industry members who come here and teach classes here, uh, and on problems that the industry give up for our students to solve. So the uh, answer that we give is that we do not teach in a knowledge-centric way. Knowledge is important. It's basic building blocks, but it cannot provide the whole structure. More than the knowledge, we need to learn how to use these building blocks to create many competencies, many skills, communication, leadership. We'll touch more on this later. Um, aside from my work here at the Technion, uh, I serve as uh, the chair of the OECD International uh, uh, Student Assessment uh, Program, uh, PISA which is the largest international test. And for 2025, we design a test on learning, not on knowing, meaning we give students challenges that they've never seen, 15-year-old students, about a million of them, and we see how they uh, work with these challenges. We actually apply some artificial intelligence there, maybe we'll get to it later in the webinar, hopefully. But I see what we do here at the Technion, I feel very comfortable, because these are exactly the skills we prepare our students to solve. We prepare them to solve new challenges and to understand the impact on society, on the world, on resources. It's not about do as I'm being told. It's about thinking outside the box, identifying challenges, identifying opportunities, and connecting between them. And also, very very well put, Ido. Also, are, are there not, and I'll address this to all of you, let me ask you, uh, Ido, first, are there not ethical challenges, right? We're talking about chat GBT and other things. You have to bring that into the challenges you, you bring to the folks at the, the Technio too, do you not? Uh, again, thank you for this question. Um, we realize now uh, having a holistic view of education, every engineer, every scientist that we help raise is also uh, an ethical decision-making uh, machine. Every decision that I make as an engineer has ethical implications. If I work with data, the bias has built in the data. I decide who to include, who to exclude, who to serve well, who I do not serve well. Every engineering project that I have has implications on earth, on resources, et cetera, et cetera. We live in an environment now, we can see with all due respect to politicians, the people that change reality now, right? Companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, et cetera, are engineers and scientists. So every decision we make has ethical as well as implications on society. And we realize this. So we grow the share um, of ethical courses. And these are applied ethical courses, ethical for uh, engineers, uh, history of science, foundations of scientific thinking, et cetera. And we provide more and more of this, not just in isolated courses, because then you do not transfer but actually we embed these across the curriculum. And all the deans and the faculties subscribe to this idea. And we really try to embed this across faculties and across courses. And uh, Chagit, uh, Chagit, what uh, are the challenges you see that face us when educating future industry leaders, for example? 
So I really believe uh, uh, some of the ideas that uh, Ido mentioned are important. Is uh, educating uh, ethical and uh, conscious uh, people. I also think that uh, we should make sure that uh, they understand the foundations and know what's there behind the hype, uh, because it's easy to get carried with uh, the hyped uh, things, which may disappear in a few uh, years. And uh, I think by understanding what's at the core and the foundations, the basic science that uh, underlies everything, you will be prepared uh, for the future, especially if you, again, keep uh, the, these uh, uh, principles that I think we mentioned uh, totally together before, the, the commitment to society, the uh, engineering approach, knowing how to solve the problems, and uh, of course, never being afraid, always looking uh, for opportunities and for uh, things that uh, could get us uh, to new uh, places. Mm -hmm. Peretz, when you, you sit on the National when, Council... When it I'm sorry, go ahead. Checking on the uh, alumni. I have one question usually that I ask them. Looking backward, what did the Technion give you? You are now a CEO of a company, you are an entrepreneur, you are an uh, um, engineer. What did the Technion give you? And usually they give me the same answer. The Technion gave me tools to solve problems I didn't know exist. And this is in line with what uh, Ido just said. So the education we provide in the Technion provide the basic tools in order to really deal with uh, uh, questions that uh, uh, right now we have no idea that will uh, appear in the future. And I believe that one of the characteristics of uh, Israelis and students in the Technion in particular is uh, daring to ask questions. Everybody asks me, uh, why Israel has become a startup nation? And I usually tell the story, I was interviewed in uh, South Korea by a journalist, and uh, he asked me this question. South Korea is an empire, technological empire. Samsung, LG, you know, you name it. But Israel, the tiny Israel is startup nation. How do you explain it? I had a translator, she spoke Hebrew, a Korean girl, and she told me in Hebrew, I know the answer, let me, let me respond. And she told him something, which he later translated to me. And she said, I was the best student in Seoul, the best student in the class. One day the teacher called my parents to complain. What was the complaint? She's asking too many questions. This is the difference. Students in the Technion ask questions. They challenge. As uh, uh, Hagit just said, the four Nobel laureates that uh, uh, originated from the Technion uh, ask questions that nobody else dared to ask. They challenged the dogma. They did a paradigm shift. And I think this is one of the characteristics that uh, make us such a unique institute and a unique country. Well, one of the, the side trips, <clears throat> excuse me, you take when you ask questions, and it's interesting because I, in my career, I've asked a lot of questions of a lot of scientists, and uh, I'm interested, and I'm glad to hear how you're answering these at the Technion. One of the, one of the uh, outcomes of doing research and asking a lot of questions is, is failure, right? A lot of times you're going to fail at what you do in order to get what you where you need to go is is that spirit also you know understood at the technion and encouraged absolutely yeah. failure is part of the learning experience and uh, uh, in many countries if you fail once that's it not in israel you fail once twice third time the fourth time will be successful and i believe that this is uh, essential for uh, uh, an entrepreneurship uh, uh, society. The failure is part of the learning experience. Ido? Yeah, I want to add to this. I often tell my students, um, if you haven't failed, you haven't tried far enough. Um, <laughs> this is really the purpose. Uh, and, and we tell this across the tech and we tell our students, if you don't fail, then you already know it. Now we're learning. Failure is part of learning. Um, 
And what this means is not just I'm okay with failure, and we encourage the students to seek failure. And this is a big challenge. And we see this challenge mainly from high school uh, to, to first year in the Technion. Because high schools do two things. First, they celebrate success as a matter of learning. And, and performance and learning are not the same. I'm learning the most, mostly when I perform the best. The other thing the schools do, high schools often do, is, is they sugarcoat everything, right? Like they try to walk the kids so they don't uh, uh, fail. And again, here say, no, it's a real world. Now, if we think how we learn as people, we learn from failure. When kids start walking, later acquire languages. These are all authentic experiences that are built from receiving feedback. So let me give an example. I mentioned this data science course where we give students big problems before we teach them the answers. Obviously, students get the wrong solution when they try. It is before instruction. What they learn through this experience is not just data science. They learn how to try new challenges and they learn how to identify and learn from their own mistakes. Now we apply some artificial intelligence to provide learners with individualized feedback. So they submit their approaches to the big challenges and they get feedback in the form of new problems. Each problem is constructed to fit the solution of the student. So they learn to analyze, debug, and improve. This is a way of thinking, right? So it's not failure as a byproduct. It's failure as a something that we want to seek in order to improve. It's a stepping stone. Let me maybe jump in and say that it's not only failure that we should be teaching. It's uh, what we're trying to teach is also the asking the questions because posing the right questions is often the most important part, phrasing the question in the right way and, and framing the context in which you are solving the problem is often the critical thing. Uh, uh, definitely, I can say from, from my uh, research topic is often uh, finding the right level, the right question that you are trying to solve, because often what you really want to do, you, you, you could be misled and try to solve a too hard question. Often what you need to do is just find the right uh, question that is solvable and is not more than what you actually need. And I think in uh, the current uh, uh, generation, the current incarnation of AI is really, you know, they abandoned uh, trying to really understand language and build a cognitive model and whatever, whatever. They are now just trying to guess the next word to, be, to say. And surprisingly, if you are doing it in the right context, in the right way, it can be done extremely well, and it's extremely the right thing that you need. Well, it's interesting that you bring up AI, because I wanted to ask you about that, since AI, well, it's on everybody. It's, it's every place, everywhere now. Uh, how does it, you know, how does it affect the educational endeavor of the Technio? You know, give us an idea how that works. Um, thank you for this question. It's, it's a big challenge. And it has a lot of uh, moving parts and a lot of unknowns, so which makes it a fun problem to tackle. Um, roughly speaking, we look at AI uh, through three different aspects. One aspect is AI as a tool. How do I teach better using AI? And I gave the example of providing adaptive feedback. If I can take a large class of 300 students, but I can interpret individual answers and provide feedback on that, that's huge success. The other thing that we use AI, it changes the learning goals, what we try to teach students, because we need to teach students how to work with AI. The future is not just hand tasks over to AI. I think that the, uh, uh, the driverless uh, cars model is not going to scale. The medical model is much more uh, realistic, where the AI provides recommended system, provides support, decision, and responsibility ultimately lies within the person. When we look at chat GPT, it's a technological tool. Being a tool, it needs a user. And different people can get different things from this tool. We can see very good analogy for this. For example, a while ago, when Wikipedia became a common tool or, or Google, Right, the fact that Google exists doesn't mean everybody uses it the same way or Wikipedia. So there are skills associated with using AI. We also do this. 
for example, by incorporating AI into our, into our, our teaching and into what we expect learners to do. For example, students in my class, I expect them to first work with an AI and then criticize the AI. The third thing we do with AI, and that is perhaps uh, the most exciting uh, avenue, is assessment. Right now, assessment is very artificial, very decontextual, right? I, I take, I do a test, it, it's, a, it's a sequestered uh, 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 process where I sit alone in a room, just me and the piece of paper, the most unlike life that you can think, right? In life, I have resources, I have peers, I can try multiple times, I have feedback. So first, with AI, uh, we can have more authentic assessment. But the main thing we can do is track students over time. For example, it gives me the option to predict early on who's struggling and try to help them. It gives me feedback on my teaching to see what works well, what doesn't work well. It changes the whole process of immediate feedback to me and to the learners. Um, and this process really changes the way we think about assessment. The other big change with assessment is if I can track processes, I can look at learning processes rather than just learning outcomes. Right, the final exam arrives too late. It's final. So it's good, we still need to do this. But I'm also curious to see the learning processes. How do students approach problems? Where do they struggle? Which skills do they apply? If we talked earlier about the need to apply problem-solving skills, AI gives you the option to interpret problem-solving skills and thus to better support them in my teaching. We've had a couple of questions from the audience who's watching this on the webinar about AI and uh, your opinion. And let me ask you, Hagid, on this, because I know you're very much involved in chat GBT. Um, should we be fearful of it? And I actually am. I, I, I don't deal with that. So. Uh, I think there will be always a need for the human uh, uh, factor. And I think uh, I think people should change. Uh, people should go for uh, um, more challenging uh, tasks. They should we should challenge ourselves, and we should not uh, conflate uh, artificial intelligence with human stupidity. We should meet artificial intelligence with human intelligence. And I think uh, people will always strive for the human connection. And I think many, many tasks that we are doing will change. Uh, the more mundane, uh, 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 cliche uh, writing uh, will still be there, it will be replaced. We won't need uh, uh, people to write these things. Machines can do it better than us. But expressing our humanity uh, is something no artificial intelligence can do and creativity and so on and so forth. And I think that's really, that's why we should uh, uh, aim our students, our researchers, uh, everyone, we should aim uh, for, again, curiosity, boldness, uh, out of the box uh, thinking and so on, and, and mission, uh, yeah. Uh, Gabe, uh, what do you see are the challenges for Technion leadership with the new generation of, uh, let me put it this way, millennial faculty members. This is uh, uh, it's a challenge for managers and uh, for uh, uh, admin, uh, uh, leadership of, of uh, university. And, uh, you know, the I have this uh, slide that should be coming up somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to show some of the people we have, and, and really it's a very diverse uh, set of uh, people and their research uh, is, uh, is exciting and uh, so, so, so different from each other. And so I have here, uh, what it will be, I guess, uh, from right to left, let's start with uh, the youngest of them, Ido Kaminer. So he's a, a researcher at the electrical and computer engineering uh, department, uh, uh, Technion uh, built, uh, Perth just told me, reminded me, a five, five million, five million uh, uh, top of the line uh, uh, laboratory uh, for uh, um, uh, electron microscopy, uh, where he's um, investigating uh, like cutting edge uh, uh, 
features of materials and uh, and everything. And you know, this was like an incredible, uh, immense uh, investment, uh, but with a high, high, high lead uh, yield, uh, like a great return on investment because he won uh, numerous awards, he brought uh, numerous uh, grants, and then of course. He just keeps uh, discovering amazing and, and incredible, incredible uh, science. Uh, second is uh, Mikhail Elad from my own department, uh, the Faculty of Computer Science. Miki is actually studying something that in a sense is like a modern uh, uh, incarnation of the Lempel-Ziv uh, algorithm because he's working on signal compression and uh, by uh, what's called sparse representation of uh, signals. And it sounds very abstract. He's actually, you know, doing uh, um, um, applied math. But really, uh, what you do with this uh, specification, sparse representation of signals, is you compress not text as uh, we had in Lempel Ziv, but we compress uh, uh, audio and uh, video uh, again. And you can imagine what it means to be able to translate, transfer all these, uh, you know, uh, streams uh, of information that we are uh, doing now. Uh, next is uh, actually um, uh, a Russian-born uh, scientist, Asya Rolls from the Faculty of Medicine. And uh, Asya is uh, studying um, the brain, uh, the mind-body uh, connection. Again, a very sophisticated lab, uh, a, a huge investment. And again, incredible uh, uh, return on investment for us both in the discoveries that will change the way the body heals itself uh, in terms of uh, uh, modern uh, med uh, medication and how medication should be given in a way that uh, we uh, harness the mind in order to help uh, recovery. And of course, just by understanding the very basic uh, 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 nature of, uh, of the way our body works. And uh, the fourth is actually Ashraf Brick, uh, who grew up in a Bedouin village in the Galil and through a very uh, meandering uh, route ended up at Technion uh, studying synthetic, uh, sy synthesizing uh, various uh, chemicals. So, you know, it's a very diverse set of people, uh, each of them doing cutting edge uh, research. Maybe I want to mention uh, this young guy on my uh, left side, the other Edo. Uh, so again, uh, the diversity, again, a uh, cutting edge uh, research on how we actually educate and uh, create the next uh, STEM uh, leaders, the uh, leaders for science, engineering, uh, technology, and engineering and math. It's interesting to see the, the diversity and also, if I was understanding you correctly, the multidisciplinary science uh, that you folks are doing. I want to ask about that. Uh, tell us about how Technion's focus on multidisciplinary science will help you to contribute to the future of science and innovation. For example, having a medical school along with an engineering or the combination of computer science and artificial intelligence. What do you see in the coming years in these fields based on what has already been developed or being imagined? And I'll throw that out for either any one of you to, to take a swipe at that. Well, uh, you're right. The Technion is one of a handful of uh, technological institutes that have a faculty of medicine. And it's interesting when the Technion Senate decided to open a faculty of medicine in 1969, their uh, decision was based on the assumption or on the prediction that in the future, medicine and technology will walk hand in hand. Uh, this is part of the decision of the Senate, this sentence. And uh, as we know, uh, technology now uh, uh, is a part of medicine. And I believe that uh, having such uh, uh, um, interdisciplinary bridge between medicine and engineering, medicine and science is really unique to the Technion. Uh, uh, the Technion uh, uh, was a hub of several uh, medical device companies uh, uh, that uh, provided uh, society uh, with means uh, uh, both for treatment and for diagnostic purposes that uh, uh, couldn't uh, uh, be uh, done without this marriage of uh, the two disciplines. And I truly believe that uh, um, 
it's part of the uh, unique uh, characteristic of the technion, this bridges between uh, fields. And uh, um, in, in, you know, when you look at to the discoveries of uh, Hershko and Chekanover, who discovered the ubiquitin system that uh, uh, is responsible for protein degradation, or uh, uh, Schechtman, who uh, discovered the quasi-crystals, I uh, truly believe that uh, the future uh, uh, is very promising for uh, technical researchers. It took me 10 minutes to meet Ido Kaminer to realize that this is uh, uh, a caliber of our uh, uh, best researchers. And uh, if you, you look into uh, uh, technion leadership, let's say in 20 years, you saw the pictures on the screen. Uh, what Asia Rolls uh, uh, is doing with uh, uh, looking how the mind help us to heal autoimmune uh, diseases. Uh, uh, in, in, even in cardiovascular uh, uh, diseases, we have uh, uh, such a link with uh, uh, um, positive or negative feelings, she is uh, uh, doing an amazing research. And uh, Ashraf Brick, who, uh, uh, as Hagit said, came from such an environment, is one of the leading chemists in Israel right now, who uh, uh, is synthesizing uh, 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 amazing compounds that will be part of uh, uh, the medical armament in the future. So. Um, the opportunity of the Technion to contribute both to the country and to society are simply immense, simply immense. Let me, let me please remind our viewers that if you have a question and in the few minutes we have left in the webinar, please use the Q&A button on your webinar screen to post your questions and uh, we'll get to as, as many of them um, as we can. Um, let me ask all of you, how do you know, how do you predict where to put your efforts into future technologies? Where to spend your money, your resources, who you're going to hire? Do you have to have a crystal ball of some kind to know where the future is? It looks like Hagit wanted to answer that one. No, they say it's, uh, it's uh, hard to, to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, when I was recruiting uh, faculty members, uh, I think what I looked is, uh, I, I would say invest in people and look for people that share our values. I think we talked a lot about them. Uh, look for people that uh, are inventive, are bright, are bold, and let them do what they want to do. I, I trust, I felt that you could trust, if you choose the right people, you could trust them to deal with whatever the world will uh, throw them. Well, I, I also looked for enthusiasm. Yeah. I remember I met uh, Ido Kaminer. Uh, by the way, every university in the world was after Ido Kaminer. He got offers from the best. He got offers from Stanford, MIT, uh, Caltech. Everybody was after him. Luckily, his aunt did her PhD with me. So I asked Hannah, his aunt, I need 10 minutes with Ido. And she arranged it. And it took me a few minutes to realize from the enthusiasm that he spoke about his research, about the future of his research. And, and for, for sure, I knew he's talented, but the personality is something to do with the success of a scientist. And uh, this is what attracted me both to Ido and by the way, to Asia Rolls. I flew to Stanford to interview Asia Rolls. I heard about her. And when she spoke about her research, I knew I would like to recruit this uh, uh, lady. And uh, she proved to be a fantastic researcher. I'll just add a quick question. You asked about how we identify work, like the crystal ball we use. Um, a question that I like to also ask my students is, I give them the, the so what test. The so what test means, okay, we did something, so what? I think the bigger barrier we have now is imagination. I think we know how to solve the problems once we identify them. Uh, so what I'm after, and it's exactly what was mentioned here, it's the curiosity, the imagination, and the so what. How does this new future open uh, possibilities, mainly positive one, right? Impact on society, on the environment, et cetera. So it's just a ball, it's not one. <laughs> do, do you think there's a lack of imagination? I mean, it would seem to me that there, you know, 
there are enough science fiction movies out there <laughs> to spur ideas and, and imagination. Uh, I actually I, think there is a lack of imagination. I think we mainly imagine what we know. Uh, Henry Ford was once, uh, he said that um, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And I think it's true, what we imagine is faster horses, not cars. How can we take the possibilities of technology and science and turn them into uses that we cannot even predict? I think that is a big challenge. How do you, how, how do you foster, foster that search at the Technion to think big? Well, um, use every means you can. Uh, as a president, I was looking for researchers that have the talent, the enthusiasm, that uh, um, are doing cutting edge research. And you can look at the history of a researcher. Usually the, the, in Israel, in order to get an academic position, you have to have a PhD and then a postdoc position in one of the best universities in the world. So when somebody uh, uh, is recruited, you have his history, you have his record, and you can judge based on uh, his previous accomplishments. Uh, uh, sometime you can predict better, sometime worse, but in most cases, you can be pretty sure that if he succeeded in MIT or in Caltech or in Oxford or Cambridge and uh, provided uh, uh, the scientific community with some uh, excellent papers that you would like to have him on your team. And this is usually what we do. Uh, this was, by the way, Chagit job during my term as a president to identify these uh, uh, talented researchers, to convince them to come, and then to start the academic uh, procedure. I think. I think I have time for one more question. And this is from someone in, in the audience. And here's the question. How has the original inclusive goal with respect to gender and origin played out? Uh, during the first class of 17 students, we have one woman studying architecture. Right now, in the last class uh, of uh, 2023, 48% of the students uh, were women, 48%. So uh, given that we are a technological institute, a 50-50 uh, uh, distribution between males and females is quite amazing compared to other technological institutes that we all know. The problem is yet that the distribution among faculties is not symmetric. Some faculties have uh, uh, more, much more uh, women than men. Uh, by the way, in medicine now, there are more women uh, uh, than men, but in the uh, core engineering faculties, still we have a minority of women. Uh, uh, electrical engineering, it's about uh, 30%. Mechanical engineering is about 20, 25%. But in material engineering, for instance, uh, equal number of men and women. So we made, uh, 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 I would say, uh, quite an achievement by having 48% of the incoming class uh, uh, women. Uh, I hope that in the future, uh, more women will uh, try the uh, uh, engineering, the core engineering uh, 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 faculties. How it is in computer science right now? It's around 35. 35%. But, but let me say uh, diversity is not just gender-based, uh, it's uh, ethnical. Uh, there are population, etc. It's uh, religious uh, uh, or uh, uh, beliefs, and uh, actually somewhere where I, personally I would like to see more is actually so socioeconomical uh, uh, background. So I would like to see more people uh, who are the first in their family to have an academic uh, degree and so on and so forth. Uh, people who come from low income uh, families, uh, etc. And I think Technion is doing its best, uh, a lot, definitely, uh, through the uh, pre-academic um, uh, preparation center. I don't know the name in English precisely. Uh, and of course, in various uh, uh, programs that try to encourage uh, students, especially once they are here, uh, to succeed in, in, uh, in their studies. Uh, and I think, uh, if we manage to create here a more uh, diverse and, and uh, 
uh, heterogeneous uh, community, uh, everyone will benefit, both the more privileged uh, students that uh, come from uh, better, so to speak, backgrounds, and the less fortunate people. Yeah, I spent most of my professional life actually in North America, Carnegie Mellon, then the University of British Columbia, if there are any Canadians there, a shout out. Uh, I spent some time at Stanford. And, and moving to the technique, the first time that I saw university with a national mission like that, without any cynicism, really is here to, uh, to carry society forward. So much dependency of the Israeli society at the technique, including diversity and inclusion. Uh, and it's beautiful to see us take this mission every day as, as a goal for ourselves. Well, that's a great ending statement from all three of you. We have run out of time. I, I want to thank all of you. It's, it's been a, an exciting hundred years and the, the few, next hundred look just as exciting. And we'll all be watching. I want to thank you all for, for taking time to be with us today. Parat Slavi and Khagit Atia. And Ido Roll, thank you for, for all the work you do and we'll, we'll keep an eye out on, on the future and thank everybody who's been part of this webinar. We're very happy that you took time to join us also. I'm Ira Flato, we'll see you on Friday, on Science Friday. <laughs>